Right guys, welcome to Aggression Lesson 1. Aggression is a Year 13 optional topic, and with many of the Year 13 topics, we are starting with the biological side of things. More specifically, we're going to be looking at the neural and hormonal mechanisms in aggression. If you want to jump to a particular point in the video, you can use the chapters in the description section to do so. And if you like the video and find it useful, please let me know by hitting the like button. There are three distinct sections that I'm going to cover in this video. Although they are technically all separate, you're also going to see that as we go through, they are also linked to one another. Neural mechanisms generally focus on specific structures in the brain, as well as neurochemical causes for behavior. And on that, we're going to be looking at the limbic system and the role of serotonin deficiency. Then on the hormonal side of things, we're going to be focusing on the role of testosterone which has long been linked to aggressive behavior, particularly in males. I'm going to talk you through the basic outline points for each of the concepts and give you enough information to write a six mark outline. I'm also going to evaluate the concepts after each bit of outline. Then we'll finish up with a couple of generic evaluation points that are useful for all biological explanations, not just the ones in this video. So our first neural explanation is the limbic system, which was linked to aggressive behavior by Pape and McLean in the mid 20th century. The limbic system is an area of the brain that helps to regulate and control emotional behavior, such as aggression, and it's made up of various subcortical structures, which are structures that exist below the cortex, deep within the center of your brain, as you can see on the right of the screen there. Two key structures in the limbic system that are associated with aggression are the amygdala and the hippocampus, both of which we are going to have a little bit of a closer look at now. The amygdala is responsible for quickly evaluating the emotional importance of sensory information and prompting an appropriate response to that information. Research has shown that if certain areas of the amygdala are stimulated electrically, an animal will respond with aggression, for example, snarling or adopting an aggressive posture. If these same areas are surgically removed, however, the animal no longer responds to stimuli that would have previously led to rage. The role of the amygdala in human aggression has been investigated by Gospic et al. in 2011, who used fMRI scans to study participants responding to mild provocation. These scans showed an increased amygdala activity when participants reacted aggressively. However, when the participants were given a benzodiazepine, which is a drug that calms the nervous system, amygdala activity decreased and aggression levels also dropped, highlighting the role of the amygdala in aggressive behavior in humans. Moving on, we have the hippocampus, which is involved with the formation of long-term memories. The hippocampus allows animals to compare the conditions of a current experience with similar past experiences. So, for example, if an animal had previously been attacked by another animal, the next time they encounter that same animal, they're likely to respond either with aggression or fear, whichever is more appropriate based on what happened the last time. Therefore, impaired functioning in the hippocampus prevents the nervous system from putting things into relevant and meaningful context, which then may cause the amygdala to respond inappropriately to sensory experiences, ultimately resulting in aggressive behavior. And that was investigated by Bocardi et al. in 2010, who found that habitually violent offenders exhibited abnormalities of hippocampal functioning. So let's start our first little bit of evaluation by looking at evidence for how the amygdala influences aggression. In 2014, Padani et al. explored the connection between the size of the amygdala and aggressive behavior. They conducted a longitudinal study involving men with varying histories of violence, tracking them from childhood all the way into adulthood. At the age of 26, these participants then underwent brain scans. 
The findings were clear. Those with smaller amygdala volumes were more likely to exhibit higher levels of aggression and violent behavior. Importantly, this relationship held true even after the researchers accounted for other possible factors. So, what does this tell us? The amygdala plays a key role in assessing the emotional importance of the information that we perceive, and when the amygdala is smaller, that ability is compromised, making a violent response more likely. Okay, so research like this highlights the amygdala's vital function in regulating aggression. So our second neural explanation for aggression is serotonin, or more importantly, serotonin deficiency. Now serotonin is a neurotransmitter with widespread inhibitory effects in the brain. It's involved in helping us to slow down and calm neuronal activity. Serotonin typically inhibits the firing of the amygdala, the part of the brain that we just talked about that controls fear, anger, and other emotional responses. Low levels of serotonin remove that inhibitory effect, with the consequence that individuals are less able to control impulsive and aggressive behavior. And that is known as the serotonin deficiency hypothesis. As a result, when the amygdala is stimulated by external events, it becomes more active, causing the person to act on their impulses and making aggression more likely. The role of serotonin in aggression has been investigated in various studies. For example, Mann et al. in 1990 gave 35 healthy participants dexamphloramine, which depletes serotonin. They then used a questionnaire to assess hostility and aggression levels, and they found that the treatment in males was associated with an increase in hostility and aggression scores. Furthermore, Vakunin et al. in 1994 found that violent, impulsive offenders had significantly lower levels of a serotonin breakdown product called 5-HIAA in their spinal fluid compared to violent non-impulsive offenders, highlighting again serotonin's role in aggression regulation. Research on non-human species has long highlighted the link between serotonin and aggression. So, for example, Raleigh et al. in 1991 studied vervet monkeys and manipulated their diets to alter serotonin levels. Monkeys fed on a diet high in tryptophan, which increases serotonin, showed reduced aggression, while those that were on a low tryptophan diet exhibited higher levels of aggression. Similarly, Rosado and colleagues in 2010 looked at dogs and they compared 80 aggressive dogs with 19 non-aggressive dogs and found that the aggressive dogs had lower serotonin levels averaging at around 278 units compared to 387 units in the non-aggressive group. Okay, And studies like this strongly support the idea that serotonin plays a crucial role in regulating aggression. Okay, so there is a bit of research support for serotonin deficiency. And finally, we have testosterone. Now, testosterone is the male sex hormone, and testosterone levels are typically eight times higher in males than they are in females. Testosterone is the hormone that is responsible for the development of characteristics typical of males. So, for example, the development of muscle mass, body hair, that sort of thing. Psychologists are, of course, far more interested in the behavioral changes that occur as a result of testosterone, one of which is aggression. Now, testosterone is thought to influence aggression from young adulthood onwards due to its action on areas of the brain that are involved in controlling aggression, such as the amygdala and serotonin levels, with high levels of testosterone being linked to both increased activity in the amygdala, resulting in more aggressive impulses, and also reduced activity of serotonin, which limits 
its ability to calm aggressive impulses. Okay, so both of the things that we talked about earlier in the video, activity in the amygdala and levels of serotonin, are both influenced by testosterone. Okay, so this is what I was saying before, even though these are technically three separate explanations, they are all linked to one another. Now, research has consistently shown that removing the source of testosterone in various species of animal typically results in much lower levels of aggression, and then reinstating testosterone or normalizing testosterone levels leads to a return of aggressive behavior. One example of that is on your screen now. The idea that testosterone is related to human aggression also comes from a variety of sources, and there is no shortage of research on this area. So, for example, men are generally more aggressive than women and also have much higher concentrations of testosterone than women. That was Dabbs et al. in 1990. Also, when testosterone concentrations are at their highest, at around 21 to 35 years old, there's also a spike in male-on-male -male aggressive behavior, which was discovered by Daly and Wilson in 1998. And then finally, research has shown that salivary testosterone in offenders is highest in those who have a history of primarily violent crimes, whereas those with the lowest levels had committed mainly non-violent crimes. And that was Dabbs et al. in 1987. One strength of hormonal explanations for aggression comes from research with non-human animals. So, for example, Giamacco et al. in 2005 conducted a review and highlighted the role of testosterone in aggressive behavior. They found that male rhesus macaque monkeys showed an increase in both testosterone levels and aggression during mating seasons. Similarly, they also found that castrating male rats reduces their testosterone levels and also decreases their tendency to kill mice. Okay, so it reduces their aggression levels. Similarly, when female rats were injected with testosterone, their tendency to kill mice increases. Okay, so I give a female rat more testosterone and she becomes more aggressive. Okay, and these studies clearly show how testosterone influences aggression across different animal species. So just before we finish off, I've got a couple of evaluation points that are more generic but are applicable to all biological explanations for aggression, whether they're covered in this video or whether they're going to be covered in the next video. All of the evaluation points that I've given you so far are strengths and they are specific strengths for specific things within the topic. The ones that we're going to go over now are more limitations that you can use to counter the strengths that we've talked about. It's useful to have evaluation points like this just in case you get asked about individual explanations and you don't have enough specific evaluation points to get enough detail. As a general rule, these are going to focus on using knowledge from issues and debates and research methods in order to give you a little bit of discussion in that evaluation section. So let's start with a bit of research methods. As a general rule, many of the studies that have been conducted into neural and hormonal factors in aggression use animals for a variety of practical and ethical reasons. Now, while research that uses animals can provide a useful starting point and can offer valuable insight, it is crucial to recognize that animals and humans differ in a lot of different ways. So whether that is brain structure, social behavior, environmental influences, motivations, all of those things are very, very different in humans. And these differences mean that findings from animals don't always directly apply to humans, and the findings that you get from animal studies can't always be extrapolated to human populations. So while the research is important, it's very important that it is viewed as part of a broader body of evidence that includes human studies, and conclusions shouldn't be drawn just from animal studies. Okay, and then we have a little bit of issues and debates. There are three separate points on the screen there. We'll go through each of them. So biological explanations for aggression are 
considered biologically reductionist because they simplify complex behaviors like aggression by attributing them solely to biological factors such as hormones and neurotransmitters and structures in the brain. And of course that does have its advantages, for example by leading to effective interventions like increasing serotonin levels in offenders, the approach also overlooks the complex interplay of social, environmental and psychological factors that also influence behavior alongside biological factors. For example, while high levels of testosterone or low levels of serotonin might contribute to aggression, they don't operate in isolation. External circumstances, past experiences, cognitive processes also play a role. Okay, so whilst it is sometimes useful to take a reductionist approach, sometimes a holistic approach might be the better way to go to gain a full understanding of a concept. Moving on, these explanations are also hugely deterministic because they suggest that individuals with certain biological traits are inevitably predisposed to aggressive behavior. And that perspective undermines the role of free will and personal responsibility, implying that people have little control over their actions. And that can have fairly complex legal implications, such as justifying aggressive behavior or criminal acts based on biological predispositions. Okay, and then finally, you could talk about social sensitivity. Okay, research into this area could be considered socially sensitive. Um, for example, if individuals are identified as biologically predisposed to aggression, they may face discrimination or negative stereotyping, even if they've never displayed aggressive behavior before. That could limit their opportunities in areas like education, employment, or even social relationships. Furthermore, these explanations could lead to discrimination through policies or interventions that target individuals with specific biological markers. Now, I'm not suggesting that you use all of these evaluation points in any essay that you write. Pick one, maybe two, okay? But it's important that you know the majority of your evaluation points should be directly related to the topic in some way. So all those strengths that I used earlier, if you can get one of those in an eight marker followed up by one of the limitations that I've mentioned here or two of the limitations that I've mentioned here, that's great. If it's a 16 marker, then you'll probably be talking about at least two of the things that I've mentioned in this video. So you're going to want two strengths, two nice studies that I mentioned earlier that are specific to the amygdala or serotonin or testosterone or whatever it might be, followed up by one or maybe two of these limitations that I've mentioned. Okay, so don't try and squeeze them all in. Choose the ones that you're happy talking about and get those into the essay, making sure that you formulated them nicely and that they make sense and that you've structured things in a way that is going to make the examiner give you the marks. Okay. Right, and that brings us to the end of the video. I hope it's made sense and I hope it's been useful. If you have any questions, please pop them in the comment section below and I will do my best to get back to you ASAP. Thank you very much for watching and I will see you in the next one.